worship services this morning. We're certainly glad to see everyone out. If you're visiting with us, we'd like to ask you to fill out an attendance card so that we'll have record of your attendance. We'd also like to welcome you back whenever you have the opportunity to worship with us here at Sunrise. Um, well, you all know this, depending on what forecast you're listening to, anywhere from about three inches to 16 inches, <laughs> we'll see what we get. Um, please be careful over the next couple of days. Um, concerning those who are on our prayer list, uh, Greg Kirkbride has kidney cancer. He's having the kidney removed Monday. Lonnie Kuffner's son, Mac, is having kidney failure, failure and is not doing well. Um, Ruth's brother, Blaine, uh, is recovering from COVID, and he will go to rehab as soon as there is a room. Uh, Judy Davis is dealing with health problems. That's Paul and Ruth. Ann Lemon's daughter. Um, Roy Clark is uh, dealing with cancer right now. He will have chemo and radiation in February. Paul Lemon is still recovering from the after effects of COVID and dealing with bad cough. Uh, Tammy Phillips' brother Mike and his wife Angie are recovering from COVID. Angie's mother is out of the hospital and the brother is back home now. Delbert White's son continues to recover from COVID. Uh, Tammy Phillips' brother Danny is having trouble with his ear draining. And Lisa Bach, who is a musician of Connie Stevens, is in the hospital and not doing well. Um, the, well, Anita Richards, oh boy, <coughs> Connie uh, Lynch, Pat, I'm sorry, give me Patty's last name. Mm -hmm. um, she just goes by Lynch. Okay, Patty Lynch. Anyway, they have all been exposed to COVID and, and they are sheltering the place right now. I understand that Angie White's not feeling well after uh, receiving a uh, COVID shot. She's at home. Please remember all these folks in your prayers. Um, is there anyone else that we failed to mention? Okay. Upcoming events, the area-wide gospel meeting <laughs> this afternoon at Lubeck Church of Christ being hosted by Barlow Vincent. Um, the uh, Ohio Winter Lecture, Ohio Winter Lecture, <coughs> January 28th and 29th. Other events are on the back of your bullet. If you want to plan farther out than that, look at those. Our youth rally will be coming up May 20th and 21st. That's not very far away. <laughs> um, please be praying about that. Please be uh, letting young people that you may know know about that. And uh, Last year we, I think, the high attendance last year was 89 people. I'd like to see that double this year. We have the facilities rented to, to do that. I'd most certainly like to see a couple hundred kids show up today. And I know you all would too. We can do it if we work at it. <laughs> all right. Anything else that needs to be announced? Mark Casanelli is going to be leading our singing this morning. Everybody join in.
Let's sing number 302. Far and near. Far and near the fields are teeming with the waves of Brian Grain. Far and near their gold is gleaming o'er the sunny slope and plain. bow with me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we pray your throne of grace this morning with gratefulness for this day that you give us, for the opportunity that we have together here to worship your high and holy name, build one another up. Father, we ask that you would be with the congregation here that you would help us to shine your light to those around us. Help us, Father, to take every opportunity to show your grace, and mercy, and power to those that we come in contact with. Father, we pray that you will be with those that are leading our nation. 
you would guide them in the decisions they make. I pray, Father, that you would be with those that are working in mission fields. You would bless their efforts. Much good might come from it. Father, we pray that you will be with us as, as we make special efforts to reach out to those around us, whether through gospel meetings or youth rallies or whatever. We pray, Father, that you will bless those works. Help us, Father, to see good returns from our efforts. Pray, Father, that you would be with those who are a number that are sick. There are many, Father, and their problems are many. And we pray, Father, that you would lay your healing hand upon them. That they might soon return to their normal health and be able to be with us once again. Father, we ask that you would be with those that are going through tough times spiritually. We pray, Father, that you will give them the strength that they need. We pray, Father, that we might recognize their needs and build them up at every opportunity we have to change. Father, we pray that you would forgive us for we've sinned against you. Pray, Father, that you would give it strength in the future to face the temptations that are placed before us, the wisdom to recognize them, free from them. Father, we pray that you would be with us as we go throughout this day. Keep us safely in your care, and we pray, Father, that the things said and done here this morning are pleasing in your sight. So, in Jesus' name, we pray. I'm going to sing number 225 uh, for communion to help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. 225. In the hour of trial, Jesus plead for me. Let my face denial, I depart from thee. When thou seest me Thank you. 
in the emblem that uh, Christ uh, established so that we could uh, uh, remember him on the first day of each week. A little piece of bread uh, represents his body and the fruit of the vine that represents his blood. We've done this so that uh, we would have a chance for eternal life. And without it, we have no chance at all. And we want to remember these things as, uh, as, we, as we take up and remember why you're taking it and remember the pain and the suffering. And he wanted us to remember it so that we, if we do it every first day of the week, we will always remember it. And that's what he wanted us to do. And, uh, like I say, without it, we have no chance at all. And this is a small thing that we do every week to remember Christ and the suffering that he went through for our sake. Let's give thanks for the bread, please. Father, we're so thankful for this bread that represents your body and the body that hung on that cross on that Calvary's cross that day. And we thank you so much for the suffering that you went through the price for our sins so that we could have a chance with an eternal home with you in heaven when our life here is through. We ask that you please bless this bread and bless us as we partake of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Ginger, thanks for the fruit of the wine. Father, we're so thankful for this uh, fruit of the vine, which uh, is used to represent the blood, your blood that flowed on Calvary's cross, <clears throat> and it washes away our sins. And we pray, Father, that uh, you'll please bless this fruit of the vine, and bless us, and please forgive us of our sins when we fail short, fall short, and, and sin again. Includes the Lord's Supper. Uh, fast and fast. Uh, if anybody wants to make an offering to the church. Number 17 will be our next song. Number 17. There's a beautiful place called heaven. It is hidden out below the bright blue. Where the good who from earth eyes are river, live in love and eternity through. Shall call us whether soon the glass. 
summer shall be. But we know when we pass over the river, the glory of Jesus will see. will be number 289 if you want to mark your song books. And the next song we're going to sing right now is number 131. 131, Where the Roses Never Fade. Facebook page. That's on Facebook, Barlow Vincent Church of Christ, um, because there is a chance um, the storm was supposed to start one, I guess, and so there's a chance that they might uh, delay that to another week. So not quite sure yet. Right now they're they're planning on doing it. So um, unless you see different, that's where they would make the announcement is on Facebook. So before you drive all that way, I would I would check that out. The work of the Holy Spirit. We're gonna take two or three weeks to, to look at, at this. And of course, if you read the bulletin article this morning, you would have noticed that if we study the complete works of the Holy Spirit, that would take a, a portion of weeks and weeks and weeks. So we're just going to look at a couple things here in the next three weeks. Specifically, we're going to be looking at Jesus and his final discourse. See, Jesus' circumstances were, were about to change. His departure would soon occur. And he would say in verse 1, 
But now I go away, or excuse me, verse 5, but now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, saying, where are you going? It's a question that we would normally ask if someone says, I'm going away, you would say, well, where are you going? Well, he's just hours away from his crucifixion at this point. He's moments away from going to the garden. So I'm sure emotion is, is overtaking Jesus at this point and, and everything going on. And he doesn't remember that, that when the questions begin to be asked in chapter 13, just three chapters earlier, that in John chapter 3 and verse 13, verse 36, you see Simon Peter said, Lord, where are you going? But you see, the problem was they weren't asking the right questions at the right time. When he's, at, when he's at the door, when he's about ready to walk out the door, there's where you should ask, well, where are you going? So Jesus answered, where I'm going, you cannot follow me, but you shall follow me afterwards. So the disciples had asked this earlier, that, that they weren't asking the right questions when they should have been. The disciples were overwhelmed by all that Jesus had been telling them, and they found it difficult to comprehend what Jesus was saying. We're going to look at a couple different things. The first of all this morning, it's all about the truth. It's all about the truth. The helper, the Holy Spirit, is all about bringing the truth. And you say, well, it's great that we have God, and it's great that we have Jesus, but we really need the Holy Spirit. Now think of it this way, we have God and God the Father and in everything that he does for us and we have God, God the Son, which is Jesus and everything that he does for us. But if he were just to die and just to leave us without a helper, then we wouldn't have a couple things that we need. We might come to worship this morning, but we really wouldn't know what to do, would we? Well, we might be able to figure out singing because that's kind of basic, isn't it? Well, we wouldn't know to take the Lord's Supper because we see that in our scripture. We get scripture because of the Holy Spirit. Well, we wouldn't know to, to open the Bible and to study it and to learn from it because we get that from the scripture. And without the scripture, I, I'm not quite sure what we would open. Maybe in the Old Testament we could read some Psalms together and things like that. But we really need to help the Holy Spirit. It's all about the truth. John 16, verse 7, the Bible would say, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Now, this is Jesus telling us the truth. He says, It is to your advantage that I go away. Now, if you look at the group of, of, of apostles and, and you go one by one around the room and, and ask them, Do you think it's your advantage if Jesus goes away? They're going to say, No, I have not no, we need Jesus. Well, we need to have him here. He, he needs to be, you know, they might even say that the king of Israel, the earthly king of Israel, well, we need to have him. But he looks at them and says, it's to your advantage that I go. You, you don't understand everything about it, but it's to your advantage that I go. And if I do not go away, you have to understand this, he would say, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I'll send him to you. I really don't know why. God knows. I don't know. You probably don't know. But why Christ and the helper couldn't be there together. But it just seems like that Jesus need to go away in order to send the helper. In order to send the Holy Spirit. But the good news is Jesus isn't going to leave us without some help. It's no surprise the disciples were filled with sorrow by Jesus' warning of the forthcoming persecution. Remember, we talked about the persecution that would be coming to them. Nevertheless, he assured them that it was to their advantage that he should go away, even though persecution would come. John chapter 8, verses 45 and verse 46 says, But... Because I tell you the truth. It's all about the truth, isn't it? You do not believe me. Now think about it this way. If Jesus is telling them the truth, and they don't believe Jesus, and Jesus goes away like he did, and then there's really, all you have left is the apostles, and, 
and, and they're a little weak at this point. If they're not as strong as they were at one point, and certainly after, uh, uh, right after his death, they're very weak. And so how are they going to go along and, and tell the truth unless they have Jesus? How are they going to along and convince and convict if they don't have Jesus? Verse 46, which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Have you ever met people that may not believe in Jesus? Now, most of that is because we haven't seen him, right? Well, seen him like he's in the front row. Jesus could walk in this morning and sit in the front row. We'd be like, ooh, Jesus is here. I believe, you know, and there would be certain aspects of Jesus to make us convinced that this person is Jesus. See, those who met him, even in that day and age, weren't all convinced that this is the Son of God. Well, that's a guy, that, that's a nice guy. That guy seems to have some, some abilities, but that's not the Son of God, what they would say. So, so even if, you know, he said, well, if I see something, then I'm going to believe it. That there were people in that day and age that saw Jesus, but did not believe that it was Jesus. So certainly in our day and time, that would be the case. See, the idea of Jesus' departure seemed disastrous to the disciples. It was only better for Jesus, but it was better for them. Go to John 14, verse 28. You have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. Oh, well, there's a, a true statement. He, you know, we would rejoice if we realized the Father. Jesus is going to the Father. We'd be happy for him. Going back to this pristine state where, where, where he doesn't live in a, an environment of sin, we would be happy for him. Jesus gave one explicit reason for leaving that would be to their advantage to help her and would not come until once he left and once Jesus was gone, he would send the Spirit to help her to them. John 14, verse 16 through 17, and I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper. So as to speak of Jesus and help them, he sure did. I'll give you another helper. Verse 16. That he may abide with you, look at this, forever. When Jesus sends the helper, the Holy Spirit, he will abide with us forever. Then he says, the spirit of truth. Well, we, that's one name for him, isn't it? Truth comes from the Holy Spirit. Whom the world cannot receive. In other words, the normal world can't receive just because there is neither, neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. John 14, verse 25, verse 26 tells us, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I say to you. This is, you know, we don't live in these times, but, but wouldn't it be awful? Speaking from a preacher, it'd be awesome to live in that time. Our people don't know how long it People think preachers work Sundays and maybe an hour on Wednesday night, and that's about it. I'm here to tell you, preaching is pretty much a 24-7 job. Because if, if there's a chance I'm working on a lesson, I'm driving a car, sometimes I'm working on a lesson. My, my brain reads books, I work on a lesson. You know, so there's, there's, there's hours and hours and hours and hours of prep that go into a lesson normally. But can you imagine if, if, if Jesus told you what to say and then the Holy Spirit made you remember what it was and gave you words to say? 
And wouldn't that be wonderful? And the reason for that, the main reason for that work was because they didn't have this work. See, we have a little bit better system, although that would be wonderful. We have the Bible we can open and, and turn to passages and read the passages and, and have the ability to understand the passage and, and put the truth into action. John chapter 7, verse 39, but, his, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit who those believing in him would receive from the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So, so first of all, it's, it's about the truth. But secondly, we'll spend the rest of our time this morning looking at this, the purpose. Now, I like in the bulletin article some of the aspects of the Holy Spirit. But like I say, if we look at all, the Holy Spirit is such a, a large subject. If we look at it, it would take us a, a, a long time to study the whole thing. But... If you want to look at the Holy Spirit and get some idea, look at 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14. And you can glance from those chapters of 1 Corinthians, some, not all, of the aspects of the Holy Spirit. But we see in John, when we're studying, chapter 16, we begin at verse 8. As we look at the purpose, so we'll see a, really a threefold purpose that Jesus gives for the Spirit. And this threefold purpose is, is still in action today, if you will. John 8 says, or John 16, verse 8 says this, And when he has come, we've been talking about the Spirit, who's coming the Spirit. When he has come, he will convict the world of sin and convict the world of righteousness and convict the word world of judgment. Or prove in IV. So he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in who? Me, Jesus. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. So the task... For of, of the helper was to expose the truth about the world. I want you to notice that. The task of the Holy Spirit is to expose the truth about the world. We live in a world of what? Sin, don't we? It's all around us. I was watching a, a, a bet on TV last night for a few minutes and this cat came in with ear mites. And of course they scraped the, the ear mite out and put it on a, a film and put it underneath the microscope and it, it looked like a monster. I mean, you should have seen the thing. It just, it's moving. And it looked like a monster. I've never seen anything like that. I don't have cats, but I've never seen anything like that. And, and, and the person says, can I get ear mites? Thinking that, I get the cat too close to me, the mite's going to jump on me or something. And, and the doctor says, no, no, humans can't get air mites. You know, for whatever reason, they're just interested in cats. And I guess cats get them frequently, I don't know. And, 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 and so when we when we think about this, you know, think about the, the not really sure why I told that story, I don't remember. <laughs> That's what my brain is trying to watch. Anyway, the, the task of the helper is to expose the truth about the world. And we live in a world that, that's not perfect, and we live in a world that, that all these things are around us, and it's hard sometimes to, to be the type of people we need, need to know. Uh, although the Holy Spirit was to be a helper for the apostles, his clearest function is described here, that, that of the prosecutor. I want you to think about this. We've always heard that God is the judge. Jesus is more like a defense attorney. <clears throat> you know, when we get to that day of judgment day, Jesus said, up, oh, Elvis, yeah, he's, he's hopefully, Elvis, he's good, you know, okay, he's, he's the defense attorney. Well, who's the Holy Spirit? The prosecutor. He brings the evidence, says, your honor, look at the evidence that's been presented here of sin and shame and, and, and all these things. He brings all that to light.
Now the Spirit would convict the world that is present, present the truth to the world situation in a clear light, demonstrating that the world would be guilty, whether or not people acknowledge their guilt, many times they don't, and call for a word, here we go, here we go repentance. Turning back to God, turning away from sin, and turning to God. So the Spirit would do His work through the words of the apostles, number one, the words of the apostles, number two, the words of the people that the apostles laid their hands on. So both of those are first century, right? Because the apostles would die off. The people who the apostles laid their hands on, which, which if you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, they're going to have some, some abilities that they're going to do that we don't have today. That would die off in, in the end of the first century. And thirdly, through the word of God. So the Holy Spirit does his work through these three avenues, if you will. Now, we don't have the first two no longer today with us. But we have certainly have the third with us today, the word of God itself. So this threefold process. I want you to notice in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, now when they had heard this, here's the work of the Spirit at work. They were cut to the heart, said to Peter, the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So we see the Spirit at work, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 25 and 20, 24 and 25. But if all prophesy, and an unbeliever or uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convinced by all, and this, the secrets of his heart are revealed. So falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. So when we look at these three aspects this morning that we see, first of all, the Spirit convicts the world of sin. And I want you to add it. It's not on the screen. Add an element here. It brings faith. So either there's sin or there's faith in God, if you will. So by convicting the word of sin, it brings faith. As Jesus did during his ministry, because people, people many times did not believe in Jesus. John chapter 16 and verse 9, of sin because they did not believe in me. So the world's rejection condemnation and execution of Jesus undoubtedly demonstrated this unbelief which is exposed in this verse as sin. Faith in Jesus is the foundation or fundamental requirement for having the approval of God. So in other words, I cannot have God's approval without faith in Jesus, and I cannot have faith in Jesus unless the Holy Spirit convicts me of the sin that I've committed. Notice Hebrews 11, verse 6, but, but without faith it is impossible to please him, him being God, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we have to understand this faith is important, and I don't have this faith unless I have the Holy Spirit convicting me of that faith. Now, understand this. A little tricky when we start talking about the Holy Spirit, it's a little tricky. Just because the Holy Spirit convicts me doesn't mean I have the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, verse 37. I received the Holy Spirit upon baptism. But yet the Word of God is full of what? The Holy Spirit. The words that we read here. Are, are really threefold. You have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, you say, well, how did the words of the New Testament, especially, because that's really what we're interested in, get written? They were written down by men that God chose, that the Holy Spirit really told them what to say. We remember, the Bible already said, we looked at that they would have the remembrance. Jesus would tell them what to say, and the Holy Spirit would help them remember what to say. In this case, remember what to write down. So faith in Jesus is fundamental. John chapter 3 and verse 18. John chapter 3 and verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. <laughs> Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. 
So this faith, this belief is, is so important. Well, secondly, the Spirit convicts the world of righteousness. Well, what is righteousness? Righteousness is doing right. He convicts the world of righteousness because Jesus was going to the Father. John chapter 16 and verse 10 of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more. This may refer to either the world's lack of righteousness to Jesus or the sinfulness of the world was emphasized as was emphasized by Isaiah who compared the righteous deeds of the people in his day to filthy garments. Notice Isaiah 64 and verse 6, but we are like unclean things. And all of our righteousness are like filthy rags. Now when it says filthy rags there, I think of when we used to send our boys off to Bible camp. They enjoyed Bible camp and it was you know, a wonderful week and we would come home and, and, and my wife would look at the laundry. If you've never sent your kids to Bible camp, you don't understand the smell. Because the laundry, you know, they get wet and they throw them in a pile and they get moldy and they throw them in a bag and, you know, everything just is wet, nasty, and smelly. And she kind of takes them out of the bag and puts them into the washing machine. I remember the worst time we had one time was, was we came home from Bible camp and the boys were supposed to go off to California, to Los Angeles the next day um, on a trip. And, and so Anne is trying to get, and it was the, their, we were celebrating their birthday. So Anne's trying to do the birthday thing with them and put all the laundry in. Well, during the war, you know, the washing machine was going, I guess, or, or whatever. No, it was before she even got the laundry in. The power went out. And the power was out for seven days, of course. Well, uh, this laundry is useful. So I think she actually had to end up washing the laundry in the sink in the dark of the smelly, dirty camp clothes and then hanging them outside to dry. And it wasn't, wasn't pretty. It just wasn't pretty. And, and so we, we see in this verse in Isaiah 64, 6, that we are like unclean things and our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities are like the wind have taken us away. So by returning to the Father, Jesus would be declared righteous. Here's where the righteousness comes. We cannot declare him righteous here. We return him to the Father. He returns to the Father. And there at the right hand of God, Jesus is, it is made all righteous. And so because of that, the Spirit convicts the world of righteousness. In other words, of Jesus while the world would be revealed as unrighteous, the Spirit, as the prosecutor declares that the world guilty and Jesus is innocent. John chapter 17, verse 25, O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and you know that you sent me. So Paul said to the Jews in Romans chapter 10 and verse 3, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. So we have to submit to the righteousness of God and understand that the Spirit convicts the world of righteousness. And Jesus was righteous, and in, 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 in a certain sense, only in Him can people be made righteous by God. And the world would ex be examined and convicted for it embracing false views on righteousness. And Jesus was innocent because he went to the Father and no one who is unholy, no one who is unholy can be in the presence of the Father. Humans are declared holy in order to be in the presence of the Father. Well, lastly, this morning, notice that the Spirit convicts the world of judgment. Of judgment. Because the ruler of this world has been judged. Notice verse 11 of chapter 16 of John, of judgment because the ruler of this world has been judged. As the Spirit would convict the world of sin and its false views of righteousness, he would also convict the world of its false view of judgment. John 12 and verse 31, now this judgment of the world, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. We read in Revelation and other, other writings what will happen to the ruler of this world, Satan. Satan is unrighteous. 
He is not truthful. He is someone for us to avoid. And the Spirit helps us stay away from him. Although it would appear that the devil was victorious when Jesus was lifted up on the cross, Jesus' death was actually Satan's defeat. Because the ruler of the world has been judged that is condemned. Jesus had, or has judged Satan and condemned him. The judgment of the devil was entailed the judgment of the world. Since the world submitted itself to the ruler of this world and became the instrument in bringing about Jesus' death, the Holy Spirit would convict the world of having made the wrong judgment. In other words, getting behind the wrong person, if you will. Indeed, like its ruler who stands condemned, the world is condemned already. I don't want to be a part of this world, but I live in this world, if you will. But I want to be a part of Jesus, and, and the Holy Spirit makes that possible. Notice John 3 and verse 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. You see, that's, that's the beginning of it, is that faith and belief in Jesus. When I believe in the Son, when I believe in Jesus, it, it, it takes me to everlasting life. I'm glad that he left us a helper, and the helper helps in so many ways. But I know one thing for sure. I'm not quite sure what I would do without this book. It didn't exist. I'm not quite sure. I know some people don't believe in it. I know some people don't believe in God. I know some people don't believe in Jesus. But I do. I hope you do. And, and, and it makes sense to me when I read it. It makes sense to me when I study it. And I'm able to understand it. And that's because of the Holy Spirit. And he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life. There's only two ways, isn't there? There's belief and there's unbelief. In that verse, there's, there's nothing in between. You're saying, well, I believe a little bit, but, but I'm going to try to live my life in the world. But I believe a little bit. That's not there, is it? He who believes everlasting life, he who does not believe will not see life. That's what Jesus tells us through the Holy Spirit who has good men to write it down so that we can read it years later. This morning is you're ready to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, to dedicate your life to him to be baptized into Christ we encourage you to do that maybe you just want to study more let us know we'd be happy to study study with you or maybe you need prayers encouragement we'll pray with you and pray for you once you come as we stand and ask you to I hear the Savior say thy strength
thank Elvis for a really good lesson on the Holy Spirit this morning. And thank everyone for coming out. Very encouraging to see the Lord's people gather and assemble and praise and worship His name. If there's nothing else, let's have a prayer and we'll be dismissed. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity we've had to come and worship you and praise you, Heavenly Father, and build ourselves up in the faith. We ask you, Lord, to give us safe passage this afternoon and this evening. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will be with us all the days of our lives. We ask you to go with us now, Heavenly Father. Give us safe journey and safe passage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.